I want to introduce myself. My name is Rebecca um, Lee. I'm a nurse practitioner um, at Ethne. Um, we're a clinic located in Clarkson, Georgia. So we serve a lot of predominantly refugee patients um, in, in Georgia. And fun fact, Clarkson is um, our nation's um, most diverse square mile. Um, so it's been pretty encouraging as I've been working there um, over the last year. Um, but yeah, so I guess today I want to just share a little bit about imposter syndrome. Um, just out of curiosity, like you guys, and I want this and like workshop to be kind of interactive as well. Um, but from your quiz, like who scored really high here on the imposter syndrome? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I feel like imposter syndrome, when you think about it, is such a big term. Um, we, hear, we hear it thrown out all the time. Um, but I think in medicine, particularly, we experience it the most. And I think even a, like a next step, like working in medicine in like very vulnerable community, we experience it a lot. Um, I just kind of want to gauge everybody here. Like who here, if you could raise your hand, um, raise your hand if you are like a healthcare provider. Okay. Oh, wow. What if you're a student? Okay, a couple of students. And then, what's other? <laughs> Medical assistants. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like support staff. Any other support staff or assistants or anything like that? Yeah, awesome. Okay, yeah, so it's pretty big. Um, I just want to start us off um, with just like kind of where it came from. So, first coined by these two um, ladies um, who are both PhD researchers um, in 1978. Um, and then they, re really, it's a, it's a term um, that describes all these symptoms of like self-doubt, fear, and competency. Um, and then it's also often linked to a lot of like other behavioral health disorders such as anxiety, depression, burnout. Um, but I think I don't know, for me it was really interesting because I think when I hear about imposter syndrome, I'm like, oh yeah, I have that, but you don't really think much about what it has. So they, when they coined the terms, um, they actually broke it off into six key characteristics. Um, so first one is imposter cycle, so where you're trying to like um, over-prepare or sometimes you procrastinate until the last, very last minute, but um, sometimes you over-prepare, um, kind of want to make sure that you're doing the best, and then you start, once you complete it, you have this this, this period where you're like scared of what you did um, and then you kind of fall back into that cycle of like okay then the next time I got to over prepare again or procrastinate again um, and so it's like a cycle of feeling that you're never doing enough. Um, second key char characteristic of it is perfectionist so you want to be the best which links with the third one where um, kind of like you are like the superman or superwoman of it where you want to um, a lot of times you're really working hard um, just to appear more capable um, in terms of the abilities to other people um, and so part and yeah so I feel like number two and number three links hand in hand where you kind of want to make sure you're doing giving it your best and making sure it's perfect um, fourth characteristic is Atikophobia, which is a fear of failure, um, where you're scared of, yeah, scared of messing up, scared of making mistakes, um, and feeling that you're never gonna be that perfect or superwoman and superman. Um, then the fifth one is denial of competence and capability, um, where you, um, when you do mess up, you often internalize that and you make it like, oh, it's my fault. Um, 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 yeah, like I wasn't good enough. Um, and then anytime you do have any sort of success, you always attribute it to like external circumstances. You attribute it to luck um, or like, oh, this coworker helped me. And so it's never about kind of you. And then the sixth characteristic is achievophobia, which is a fear of success. Uh, and part of it, like, which is, so it kind of links with fear of failure. So you are scared of messing up, but then sometimes you're also scared of like, being successful, and I think it comes to that idea of like externalizing success to luck, um, where when you're successful, it's like this idea is like, oh, but it's not me. I think it was just by coincidence. Um, so this, those are kind of the six characteristics that um, those two women um, uh, would characterize imposter syndrome. Um, and then just some statistics, especially within the medical field. So one in four physicians experience imposter syndrome symptoms, so the burnout, depression, all those symptoms, um, um, unfulfillment, suicidal thoughts. So one in four, so that's 25%, which is kind of crazy. So we have one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, like, I don't know, like 20 people. So 
five out of the, no, I can't do that math. Yeah, we five times. Yeah, five out of those 20 people here would experience imposter syndrome. Um, probably not this crowd because we're all here, right? And so, um, but that's a lot of people. Um, but next statistics, 30%. Um, so if you compare in our population, um, those who are like, like healthcare providers and those who are not, if you are a healthcare provider, you are 30% more likely to experience imposter syndrome than those who aren't in other fields such as teaching, education, finances. Um, and then the last one is pretty big, it's 80%. So compared to other doctoral like professional programs, so like PhD, um, I'm thinking about like, I don't know, masters of engineering, like 80% um, of those in medicine, they are more likely to experience imposter syndrome than compared to their peers, which is a lot. And so I think that comes to say that like, I think, again, back to what I was saying in the beginning, like working in medicine, you will, we will come across this idea of imposter syndrome. And then even more when we're working in, in like very vulnerable, vulnerable population where we don't have as much resources compared to other private practices, uh, we, I think we are at an even higher increase of um, just experiencing imposter syndrome. Um, yeah, I kind of just want to open that up. Like, what were some of your thoughts as you just read some of those statistics? Yeah. What is it about healthcare or medicine or the training that makes us more vulnerable to this? Like, what are the factors that are in that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. Yeah, I think like what's scary is that like sometimes I, I tell my fiance this a lot. I feel like I have like this decision of life and death <laughs> where like uh, he's a dentist, he will have some too. But like compared to like other, I don't know, a teacher, like you don't have that like power or supposed power of life and death kind of over a person. Um, yeah. Um, and then so that. My goal of this session today is really just for us to gather together and like kind of like normalize it. So I like kind of just like pulled out like what does secular research say about like treatments of imposter syndrome. So it's really interesting. Like I was reading a paper where it would go literally like etiology of imposter syndrome, um, what it is, um, and then like literally like if you think about like a soap note, like assessment and plan. And so this is kind of what I gather from all those research papers. So in this secular realm, um, their plan for um, imposter syndrome is number one, normalizing it. Um, I think like uh, right now in society, we have this idea where like imposter syndrome, like it's not, that's not something good. But I think like if we talk more about it and like this is something that like every, like a lot of us go through um, just to make it normal, um, we have less shame when we talk about it and we have less shame when we're trying to like learn from our mistakes um, and like try to learn about what to do better. Um, and so doing that as a, like individually and also as a group. And so they did a lot of like group therapy in um, imposter syndrome, which is interesting. Um, and that comes across like reflection. So like gathering together as a group, just sharing about it and like reflecting about it. Um, the third thing is um, some, another plan, which is to kind of um, accepting positive feedback. I notice this myself. Anytime somebody says something good about me, I'm like, oh no, but that's not me. That was blah, 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 blah. Um, but I think just like learning, like, okay, but those are good feedback for us. And like, what can I learn from that? I'm like, okay, that's something I did well in. Um, how can I continue that? Um, and also just like taking negative feedback too, or constructive feedback as, as a learning process um, as well. And then the last thing was like embracing self-positive talk. So like, they, there was a paper that said like, um, where like people who like kind of talked the talk positive characteristics about themselves, like for some reason they were able to dwell better, um, thrive better, um, and just like um, not feel like they were an imposter. Um, I kind of want to get back to that this slide because like this is what the secular realm said, um, but I really feel like the Bible has a lot to say about the imposter syndrome as well. Um, so we'll we'll delve more into it, um, but. 
I think I want y'all to kind of gather in groups of two or three and just kind of share sometimes where you like have experienced imposter syndrome, either in medicine, well, let's stick with medicine. And so in medicine, in either what you're practicing or in school, if you're a student, like just what are some experiences that you had? Um, and again, this is back to the idea where like, I want us to normalize it and reflect it as a group together. Um, and so together, you know, we're brothers and sisters um, and we're coworkers really in, in the kingdom of God. Like, what are stories that you guys have? Um, if you guys could share a little bit about it for like five or 10 minutes. I'm gonna give you one more minute, try to wrap up. Um, I hope you guys could share a little bit of those stories. Um, I mean, definitely continue them later on. Um, but I just wanna, again, that was to normalize it. Imposter syndrome is normal, and it's, for us, it's even much more so. Um, I kinda wanna shift gears, because I wanna shift gears, because when we're practicing medicine, I think it's like the biggest thing that has helped me the most is that I am not practicing medicine on my own. I'm practicing with other coworkers besides me. I'm also practicing with God the Father, who's the author of life and death with me. Um, and so I wanna go to the Bible together. Um, and there's two passages. We're gonna like separate um, into like two, two, we won't read both of the stories, but we'll share about it. You can do this in groups or you can do it individually. Um, but if this side of the room can, um, kind of read together Exodus 4 and then this side of the room read together Jeremiah 1 and then I, as you guys read the passage um, I want you to kind of think about what is what does it say about man and what does it say about God those are the two questions I want you to reflect on um, but these are two men who I think in my opinion I've, I've studied through these passages on my own when I've been in my lowest of times and I think for me like I think they were definitely feeling imposter syndrome for sure but God has said stuff otherwise and so I kind of want you to study it um, together or on your own okay let's go to the first passage together and I'd love to guy you guys um, kind of just answer some of the questions or some of the reflections that you guys had but um, I'll read Exodus 4. So I'm reading from the ESV version. So it says, Then Moses answered, But behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice. For they will say, The Lord did not appear to you. The Lord said to him, What is in your hand? He said, A staff. And he said, uh, Yeah, and he said, Throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses ran from it. But the Lord said to Moses, Put out your hand and catch it by the tail, so that he put out his hand and caught it, and he, it became a staff in his hand, that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. Again, the Lord said to you, um, you. Again, the Lord said to him, Put your hand inside your cloak. And he put his hand inside his cloak. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous, like snow. Then God said, Put your hand back inside your cloak. So he put his hand back into his cloak. And when he took it out, behold, it was stored like the rest of his flesh. If they will not believe you, God said, or listen to the first sign, they will, may believe the latter sign. If they will not believe even these two signs or listen to your voice, you shall take some wa water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground and the water and the water that you shall take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground um, I'm actually going to continue on to verse 10 but L L Moses said to the Lord oh my god I am not eloquent either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant but I am slow of speech and of tongue then the Lord said to him who has made man's mouth who has made him mute or deaf or seeing or blind is it not I the Lord now therefore go and I will be with your mouth and teach what you shall speak um, but he said, Oh my Lord, please send someone else. Then the anger, anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, is, it, is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well. Behold, he is coming out to meet you. And when he sees you, he will give you, give, be glad in his heart. Um, you shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth. And I will be with your mouth and with his mouth and will teach you both what to do. Um, he shall speak for you to the people, and he shall be your mouth, and he shall be as God to him. And take in your hand this staff, which, which is, which, uh, with which you shall do the signs. Um, sorry, it should have been a little bit longer to 17. Um, but just from that, what, do you, what does it say about man? What does it say about Moses? What was he feeling inadequate of? Mm, say that louder. Yeah, doing what God asked him to, which is really to... Um, speak to Pharaoh and also lead the people out from Egypt. He was complaining. <laughs> he was complaining about his lack of things. Um, what does it say about God? 
Yeah. So he provides. I think his patience in the beginning too, like the first time Moses complained. Um, I mean, I don't know. He was like, but like I'm the one who kind of made your mouth. Um, I don't know. He like just that continuous dialogue with him. He could have, God could have just said, like shut up, you know. Um, but his patience in the beginning with it. What else does it say about God? Yeah, so he uses us as, yeah. Yeah, and I think we all know now Moses is someone who's like, I mean, I think even if you're not Christian, every someone, like people out there know who Moses is. Um, but I think it's like, I don't know, in the beginning, like Moses was not feeling confident. He didn't feel like he was worthy to be God's servant. Um, but then later on, as you like keep reading ex through Exodus, like Moses, like, He's the one who's like talking to God, face, you know, like in the same place um, where he sometimes has to like cover his uh, face because his face was um, supposed to be super bright when after he talks with God, um, and so it's just like that ch change. But Moses started off first feeling incompetent and inadequate. Um, second story, this is the right one. So Jeremiah one to ten. Um, actually, let's let's go. Yeah, let's just say. From four. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, oh Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am only a youth, for to all whom I send to you, you shall go. And uh, whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. Um, yeah, from that, what does this passage say about man? What was Jeremiah worried about? That what? Yeah, not being enough. He said he was like only a youth. Um, what did God say? Do not be afraid of them, for I'm with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Yeah, I love verse 5 where it says, Before I formed you in the womb, I already knew you. I already consecrated you, made you holy, and I appointed you to be a prophet to a nation. So he, from the beginning of conception for us, he already had a plan for us. He had a plan for each and every one of you to be exactly where you are right now. Um, and I don't think he leaves us hanging. Um, yeah, I think I, I really wanted to touch those passages. Because, um, like, I think when we think about imposter syndrome, like, uh, oh, uh, when we think about imposter syndrome, um, yeah, you know, what the secular world says about it is like, yeah, coming together as a group, reflecting and stuff like that. But I think as Christians, we have something also even more powerful than that. Like, I want us to normalize it. I want us to talk about it. I want us to speak self, like positive words, but I want us to do it through scripture. And so if we go back to this, like, I, th I think in, like God calls us to like be in a community um, with, where we can talk about these things. Um, and then like where it talks about like embracing self-positive talk, like I think that is like through scripture. Like embracing scripture, truth, and kind of repeating it to our souls. One, of, one thing, um, so I work with a lot of students um, in the community and youth in our community. And one thing I always tell them, uh, tell them is that like, when you are sharing the gospel with other people, do you share that same gospel to yourself? Because a lot of times we do not share the gospel enough to ourselves. We don't speak truth to our souls. And that's when we are faced with a lot of doubts. We are faced with a lot of lies and we feel we're not good enough. Um, but like, um, yeah, but like God, again, God already ordained us to be where we are. and. Um, like medicine for us is a ministry um, and I think God honors that and he will not leave us hanging um, if we want to if we are desiring to pursue medicine you know share compassion with his people um, he does he will equip us with the ability to do so um, and so I think that's something I want to like us to remember um, today um, so I kind of want to throw out some statistics because I think what we were sharing before is that a lot of times where we feel like we're inadequate is because we have like, we feel like we have 
the power of life and death in our hands and that's scary like i remember there are times throughout like my weeks where i'll wake up in the middle of the night and i'm like oh my goodness did i miss something with this patient or like the other day the other week i was like oh I, did i calculate this medication right like you know i just have these like random moments of fear and doubt um it sucks sometimes like i want to be freed from it um, but i just kind of want to share some statistics because like um yeah the question is does medicine actually prolong life so over the years, um, from 1950, I think, until like 2015, they've done a study um, of like life expectancy. And there has been, obviously, with um, improved like public health or improved like just um, knowledge of infectious disease and medications, there has been an increase of life expectancy. Um, but only 35% of that is attributed to like medic medicine or like medical work or like pharmaceutical stuff. So. That's honestly not a lot. <laughs> I mean, it's awesome that we are able to like increase in our life expectancy, but um, yeah, I feel like for me personally, I feel like 90% of what we, 90% of improved life expectancy is due to medicine, but it's not, it's a lot lower than that. Um, a few more statistics um, from a research paper. So um, from 1991 to 2004, life expectancy in US improved by two and a third years, mostly by in you know medical drugs and, and innovation so that's only two years mortality from heart disease in the u.s did fall during that time period of 1950 and 1995 um, which increases life expectancy by three and a half years um, medical interventions or you know um uh like uh you know um um, like behavioral health programs to help people to quit smoking that increase life expectancy by two years. Um, when we decrease the diastolic, and this is for male, um, but if we, when we decrease the diastolic blood pressure through, you know, hypertensive um, medical medicine um, agents um, to below 88, that only increases the life expectancy to one to five years. Um, when we try to decrease the cholesterol levels to less than 200, um, that, uh, some, that will increase it to half a year to four years of your life expectancy. When we're trying to educate people to kind of get their BMI down to not um, obese or overweight, um, that increases about one year, one to two years. And then trying to eliminate coronary heart disease mortality um, um, for um, a, a, like a 35-year-old male, um, that increases life expectancy to three years and similarly for women as well. Um, so it's actually not a lot. You know, I think like when I think about like, oh, we, we want to manage their BPs, make sure they're, you know, in the 120s, 80s, like um, I'm thinking like I can save this person's life from an MI or a, like, or a stroke or whatever, um, but it only increases it by so many years. And you know, but that's, I do want to celebrate that. that, that's still something awesome compared to like back then, but I think I just want to, you know, go back to that mindset of like I do not have someone's life in my hands. I do not have control of someone's life expectancy in my hands. Um, there's so many other components um, that plays a role. And a lot of it is like social determinants of health as well. Um, um, but yeah, or like where they're living, if they're living in like violent communities or stuff like that. Um, so there's just so much more beyond medicine. Um, and so, I don't know, I kind of want to share a little bit about my personal journey. I feel like just backstory, like, so, I just started my first year um, at Ethne, um, and like the patients that we see is like is like beyond what like I trained for, because <laughs> um, I'm like so used to working in like with middle class and upper class, like um, like yeah, English speaking patients. But our patient population, like at least 80% do not speak English. They don't even know how to read English. They double up on their like hypertensive meds because they can't read it. Um, they come with like weird conditions that I've like read about only in a textbook and I've never seen before. And so like I have struggled with this so much in my first year, um, and I still am. But um, I, I just kind of want to share practical things for me that I I have been doing, um, and like obviously God has like been showing me as well. But prayer um, is a big thing. Um, I, I think that's if anything that's the biggest lesson I've learned throughout this first year. Um, I cannot see patients on my own. I always need to be constantly 
constantly praying. So before I start my day, I do, I pray for my patients on my schedule. I pray for my staff. I pray, so I have, um, cause this is kind of like my residency a little bit too. Cause so I have like doctors who are kind of over me during my first year, but I pray for it. So for all the students, I pray for my attendings of the day. Um, um, I pray for their wisdom. I pray for their safety as well. Um, I pray in the patient visits too. Um, there are so many times where I'm like, there's just ideas that flow into my head that I'm like, wow, I think this is totally from God. And again, part of it is because like getting history from non-English speaking patients with cultural back, different cultural backgrounds than I have, it's so hard to get history. And I'm like, half the times I'm struggling with this interpreter on the phone who is not interpreting exactly what I'm saying. Um, and so I'll share a story. One time um, I, had a, I had a patient um, who was complaining about blurry vision. And I was like, oh, you just need to see an optometrist. And then, but he was just so bothered. But I like, as I asked more questions, like this blurry vision does not, it's not all the time. It's just like sometimes, but it's every day, but it's just certain moments. Um, and it's just like vision changes. I'm like, okay. Um, and then like, for some reason, I just thought to ask like headaches. Like, do you have headaches with it too? And then he was like, oh yeah, I do have headaches. Actually, like the headaches are pretty bad and they have it for like many, many, many hours and they don't go away until I like, you know, fall asleep or like take a Tylenol and like bright lights and loud sound make it worse too. And I'm like, dude, I think you have a migraine and the brain vision you're talking about is an aura. And so I started him on like a um, prophylactic, like, like anti-migraine medication. And then like a month later, it's gone. But I was like, that was like for me, like a lesson like I was praying and like this he spoke this like weird dialect that like not many people speak um, um, and so it was just like yeah for me that was a lesson like I need to be praying in my visit and like God grants God is ultimately the one who like grants all these creativity and wisdom and like exactly what questions to ask um, and so that was um, yeah um, just praying throughout the visit and even just short prayer popcorn prayer throughout the visit um, and then also praying after the day it's like hard sometimes to leave work at work and i think i think a lot about like where they're at especially when i'm home um and so just like praying over those patients even if i miss something praying that god like protects them and heals them um, um and then just leaving at that um and so prayer 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 that's like the biggest thing um and i guess back to in the second point like who isn't like I am not in charge of life and death um God is I can decrease someone's blood pressure down to 120s right I can make sure that their cholesterol level is like well managed um but they can get into a car accident the next day and they can be dead um you know and so I am not the I am not the one who um can prolong someone's life God is in, is in charge if anything what we need to be worried about or conscious of sometimes is their spiritual life too um, um yeah one of the doctors um yeah like she would share with me she would be she would say like um yeah we are here to like care for their physical health but a lot of times we're also here to care for their spiritual health because they can't they won't hear about jesus anywhere else um and so yeah um and then third thing is um learning be excited to learn ask for help be ask for work with I think just one thing I'm grateful for is just working with people who are willing to work with me and help me um, and ask I will ask questions they'll ask questions um, but like being like reminding yourself that you're not alone and that you can reach out to other people around you within your clinic outside of your clinic things like that and then the fourth thing is like preaching scripture over yourself um, and so I'll yeah uh, there are, this is a silly exercise but there are times where I'll stand in front of the mirror and I'll just like repeat like attributes attributes of God and what God's truth is over me um, and that's just yeah before I start the day or like after my day because um, I think once you get, sometimes you'll get wrapped up in just thoughts of the day and then your thoughts spiral and then and it goes downhill and then you feel like you messed up um, but like preaching scripture over yourself the same way that you're preaching scripture over to your patient or sharing scripture with your patients um, share that with yourself as well I think just like the last thing is like just a practical thing is just like it's something called dot stopping um, is like an actual thing that they use in like uh, like behavioral, uh, I don't know, but like just like when they're gathering together and like behavioral therapy and stuff like that, um, it's like a common tool that they use. Um, but I kind of want to make it more so. And what they say is that like taking thoughts that are in your head, 
writing it down on your paper, and then kind of like, like when, because it's like in your thought, and when it's on paper, like, okay, is this thought actually true? And then kind of like correcting that thought um, right alongside of it. Um, and so that's what they usually do. Um, but I think like as believers, like I think we can also do that too. But taking thoughts in our head, writing it down on paper, and then like what does scripture say about that, those thoughts? Um, and so, um, yeah, like those are just um, something that's like useful. Um, and so I like encourage you to do that as well. Um, and then like putting post-it notes around your place or stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I kind of just want to leave off with this last thing um so it goes back to this thought of like thought stopping but it's in second corinthians it says for though we walk in the flesh we are not waging war according to the flesh for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh but have divine power to destroy strongholds we destroy arguments and every lofty opinions raised against the knowledge of god and take every that thought captive to obey god being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete um yeah, so I think just that idea, like taking every thought captive um, and, and like putting it before God. Um, um, and yeah, making a daily practice of it as well. But I hope this is just the start. And I really hope that like, yeah, you guys can talk about it also with just like your clinic too and like coworkers at your clinic as well. Um, but yeah, thank you guys for joining. <laughs>